Now that BMX had spread across the country, the bicycle companies started promoting themselves by taking their teams on the road. Without a doubt, the very first tour for BMX was 1974 Shimano BMX Tour. This was a way for riders to be completely free and still get the word out about BMX. In 1978, the NBA and Schwinn learned to get the most out of touring. They used the tours to help promote the sport. The tour was really based on, A, of course, Schwinn wanting to promote BMX, based on the growth of BMX. B, um, they wanted to have good ambassadors of the sport to go out there and help sell. Um, but we're all kids, you know, kids do silly things. I mean, there's things that we did the first tour. What I always remember was like, man, we gotta get to the hotel so we can jump our bike in the pool. You know, that was like the cool thing to do. You know, set up the lawn chairs and if you see the manager coming out, man, you gotta like get out of there because that's not cool to do, but we were kids. Before the professional organized tours, there were a series of wild legendary ones. The 1976 SE Tours with Scott Bridehop. Scott organized his tour by selling slots on his bus. I think it was $600 to go on the bus. And that, that included, you know, hotel room and tr all the transportation and all your meals. He would give you an allowance and take care of you. And that was, that was the, that was the deal. Deal. <laughs> In my mind, I thought it was going to be, uh, when he said he had a bus and it's going to be all tricked out, I thought this was going to be cool. We're going to, it's going to be like a Greyhound bus or, you know, something semi-plush. It turned out to be this beat-up, tore-up old school bus. So that was the beginning of a legendary tour for us. On the first tour, they drove the White Whale. Then there was the Ludlow Flyer, followed by another big white van. And finally, the tricked-out Camo Bus. So anyway, they rolled off and the, they were going to go to Georgia and then up the coast of Tennessee and back down to Florida. I remember we went down there and then up to New Jersey and through Kansas and then Texas and then Denver. Uh, I don't remember the exact route, but it was, it was sort of like that. The bus, you know, we took off and it was great. You know, you know, we're having a blast, you know, in the bus, playing around, you know, spent like three months trying to get it ready, gut it out and make it work. But um, we were driving it. In fact, I was driving it and uh, it just, all of a sudden we were coasting. They never got out of California. I thought we were in like Egypt, but we we're only just right outside of San Bernardino County, near State 40, I think it was. And I think it was a town called Ludlow, which was now known as the Ludlow Triangle, because it kind of sucked us in there. And I think they stayed a week there trying to get the bus fixed. It's gonna take too long to get the bus fixed, so they piled everybody into Scott's Dodge van. It was extended cargo van, but it didn't hold 14 people but that's how many people they crammed into it. Uh, we built a people rack. You know how they slide pizzas into an oven? We built a three-tiered people rack, and we slid in Eddie King and Greg Hill and Sean McEwen and all the smaller guys. If you were under 13, you were in the rack, and then the older kids got in the front. Had three tiers of plywood bunks, and we hit a bump or something, and they all collapsed on each other. If you can imagine a 41-hour straight across the country blitz in a van, to make it to Atlanta, Georgia for July 4th event with 21 kids, 21 bicycles on the roof, and my side hat. There were some adventures to be told. Everybody get on board. You can get a Cadillac from the lawn. Twice we blew all but one lug nut off the back wheels because the car was too heavy. Blowing up four motors in 10 weeks was uh, pretty catastrophic. It was tough on the kids. Um, we ended up in a uh, one-ton van, the old, we called it the White Whale. The night before we left in it, it got rear-ended by street sweepers, so the back doors were held together with a chain. And it's like, oh God, that was such a nightmare. But, you know, each day that we were on this tour, it was like a whole new discovery. Pretty wild. If my bus could talk, I'd be in jail, bottom line. <laughs> if you can imagine taking 21 of the top wound up, wired for sound kids, champions, maniacs, on the road for 10 weeks at a time. We make the bad news bears look like a bunch of sissies. We had a lot of good times. We did a lot of safety clinics and then turned it into a racing clinic. Now that's the formal side of it. On the other side. I lost my virginity on that tour. It was the 70s, you know, it's whatever you did in the 70s with rock and roll and girls and other activities, you know, that. <laughs> <laughs> we would go into Denny's with 18 people, and Bright Hop would say, all right, you three sit over here, you guys over there, you're over there. When we're done eating, you, I'll give you the word, and then we're all leaving, and we would not pay. I mean, we did that 100 times. That's a pretty good influence. <laughs> it's amazing that 
parents let their kids go on this thing. Because this is like hard copy material if it was on TV nowadays. It's amazing that my parents let me go because I mean, you know, it's like a 13 year old, you know, with Scott, you know, the supposed old man of BMX when, uh, you know, he was just a kid too. I had a full beard and everything else and they figured that I knew what I was doing. Uh, I don't know, sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't, but I learned a lot. I don't know, overall the tours were, uh, were awesome because we were kind of revered and we would go into a town and then we went out and dominated the races. It wasn't, you know, hey, how'd you do? It was, how far did you win by? You know, and that was the standard with our guys. You look back at it now, it was a hell of a lot of fun. You know, and we got tons of publicity off that thing, but I would never want to travel in some old revitalized bus again. <laughs> The first rider-owned bicycle company was SE Racing, started by none other than Scott Breidhop, who was later joined by Mike Devitt. The company became the major force in BMX. SE Racing was a phenomenon. Um, I'm blessed to have experienced it, really am. And basically I was a kid with a, a vision, and a kid, teenager. When he started SE, um, it was really him putting together a promotional tour for BMX, not necessarily his company, just for BMX in general. And he rounded up a bunch of kids. He called his company, the promotional company, Scott Enterprises. We were the racers riding all this top name product and going out like an all-star team. And we went out and whooped ass. And the only thing we made for our first year of existence was t-shirts, hats, jerseys, sticker packs. And it was very successful. And it, in the course of uh, the tour, Scott being the promoter that he is, stopped at a lot of shops, visited people. They wanted whatever the heck he was involved in. And we did hundreds of thousands of dollars in business. I had 325 dealers before I ever made my first friend. And when he came back, he was all wound up and the opportunity was there to do something. FMF had basically closed the doors on their bicycle uh, venture and Scott went to, to Bill Bastian that had made that stuff for FMF and did the uh, basically the PK Ripper. Scott comes up with the flow oval tubing flat on the outside oval and top of bottom you know and that was Jeff's bike the JU6 and Scott's all yeah don't worry you're gonna get a PK replica somewhere down the road and then a little bit after that Jeff's dad started a company called GJS so we kind of could see the writing on the wall that Jeff was probably going to leave and that just like opened the door for me. We took the PK Ripper out of the gusset and made a few changes, you know, and then uh, Scott's, well, this, okay, this is going to be your bike now. The PK Ripper instantly became a success. We were 2,000 pieces back ordered before we shipped our first item. And we stayed that way for several years. SE just grew and grew and grew. Oh, yeah. I was sure freestyle was a fad. Here's these gay looking guys with pink bikes and purple and neon colors and all this. You know, they weren't my kind of ar, ar, ar guys, you know? And uh, they're doing all this fancy footwork and this, you know, freaky stuff. Um, you know, that was my own misconception. They were talented athletes. I had Mike Buff, I had R.L. Osborne, I had Eddie Fiola, I had Matt Hoffman, some little Yahoo kid out of Oklahoma that could do anything and was dead fearless. And uh, yet I didn't do it right. And some of the problems we had was the ability to delegate. It's hard, this is my baby. This is, this is my life, I'm living it. You know, 16, 18 hours a day and racing and being competitive, it was difficult. People with his brilliance get sidetracked and he got sidetracked a few times. All of his, all of his fire and creativity and drive and wanting to do it and get there, and if you had to skip a few things to get there, well, skip them, just get there, you know? Is also what caused him all his problems later on. That's a sad thing. Life's a tough number. I failed miserably at a lot of things. I also had a lot of successes. Scott had all the advantages of, he had, you know, he was a famous racer, and you know, he knew, he had all the connections, and he knew everybody, and it should have been him. You know, he should have been, you know, the biggest that there was. Instead it was Mongoose and it was Gary Turner and Richard Long and it was all the other guys that really stayed focused on their business. I had my own period of self-destruction there, you know. I got into cocaine and all that stuff and, and I regret that immensely because I lost friendships, I lost respect, I lost credibility, um, I lost self-worth. I just buried myself and there was stuff that was so far underground 
with emotionally that I'd never dealt with, that I masked with this big ego and this stardom that I didn't deal with it. And it damn near killed me. He has poured a, a whole lot of um, himself into, into BMX to keep it alive. Um, he's had some troubles. Um, and I'm sure he spoke about them. And he's, and he's being very candid and, and hopefully open. And in that way, it will allow people that view this to understand that you know, there are repercussions to some of the choices you make in life. So choose, the, you know, choose your battles wisely. We had some great racing together. It was motocross. It was fun. He put a lot of time into the sport. Sometimes I thought he was more of a promoter than a racer, but he could do both really well. And uh, best of luck to him.